I'm here with Jocelyn Artinger, who is the Literacy Coordinator for School Transformation with Pittsburgh Public Schools. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks, thanks for having me. How are you holding up? I am holding up. Um, you know, I have two little ones here, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. So I feel like we've been pretty busy um, trying to keep them engaged. We had a wonderful tea party today. Um, with Evelyn and a couple other friends. So that was great. Um, doing a lot of yard work when possible keeps them busy. So we're trying. How about you guys? We're hanging in there. You know, that tea party was a blessing. And I should also say that right clearly you're an ECDC parent. And I so am. It's doubly delightful. Um, and it's a little hard. I think we're all starting to climb the walls at this point. <laughs> We've got a long way to go to protect Absolutely. the community who need it. So literacy coordinator for school transformation. Tell me a little bit more about what that means. Sure, um, so what my work does is I primarily focus on our schools who are in need of the most support. Um, and I work with teachers, I work with literacy coaches, I work with principals in developing plans um, to improve literacy instruction and literacy outcomes for students in those classrooms. So a lot of my work right now is focused at schools like Pittsburgh King, Pittsburgh Morrow, um, and we're doing some really great things there. So I'm pretty proud of uh, the teachers and the team that, that I work with. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm so glad mm -hmm. you were with us. You know, we chose not a light subject for discussion <laughs> this evening. Netflix's 13th, the Anna DuVernay documentary really highlighting some tremendous systemic or institutional injustice in our society. Mm -hmm. I imagine folks who are joining us have watched. If you haven't had a chance to watch, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's not, not an upper. You're not going to feel good when you are done with yeah. it, um, but feel tremendously informed and recognize some of the work we have to do. Jocelyn, how did you feel when you were watching this? And then how do you, how do you hope others feel? Yeah, so um, I had originally watched the documentary um, probably like right as it came out, I believe in 2016. And so um, I had also read Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow. And so I was a little bit prepared, um, but it just was so powerful seeing all of the images. Um, and it was just also really devastating. Um, to be quite honest. And I'm so re-watching it, especially in the political context that we're in right now was also really, really hard um, and just kind of like emotionally taxing. And tell me someone who didn't do that advanced reading, who maybe didn't get to read the new Jim Crow or Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. If you're seeing this for the first time, mm -hmm. What would you want people to feel or experience or questions? What's the general sense you would hope that others might take? Um, so for me, I would hope that if you were not aware of the injustices within the criminal justice system, I would hope that it would ignite not only a passion for you to help fight um, and, and change that system, but also to think more critically about your role in that system and um, lots of other systems to think of how can we do more um, from where we're sitting, even right now, as we're, as we're talking. Um, you know, I'm thinking of incarcerated people right now, um, and there's not really a lot of action happening in terms of coronavirus even. And so incarcerated people are going to be more likely to catch and potentially die from um, coronavirus because of the Petri dish that they're sitting in. And so, um, you know, even making phone calls to governors and representatives about like, what is our plan in helping safeguard some of these people who may not even have been convicted of crimes. They're still waiting um, for, for trials, but because they're on bail um, or haven't been able to pay bail, excuse me, um, you know, they're just sitting in, in jails and in prison cells. So um, I hope it kind of ignites a, a fire in, in folks. 
That's right. One of the things the documentary pointed out was that while the United States has less than 5% of the world's population, it has more than 25% mm -hmm. of the incarcerated individuals, which particularly in this time we recognize as a, as a true threat to their safety, right? There, there's Absolutely. no, we've known for a long time that prisons are not about rehabilitation. And now we see the true threat that they really are to our lives. Absolutely. So another quote from this, from the documentary, it says, quote, systems of oppression are durable and often reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what other systems, so this focuses on the criminal justice system, but what other systems are perpetuating an institutional racism right now? So I think, I think that that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I thought a lot about that when I got your email with the questions. And um, one, of the, one of the systems that I am obviously very passionate about is our education system. And I think a lot about what policies and practices within our own system um, look like, especially within the context of Pittsburgh Public, because we have our magnet system that works um, in some ways to segregate students and to resegregate um, our district. And so I think a lot about, about that and um, even segregation on a larger scale. You know, when I think back to Brown v. Board, the intent of that was to um, create equal educational systems, but unfortunately that is not what we're seeing. And I think maybe about 10 or 15 years after Brown v. Board, there was Millic Milliken versus Bradley. And that decision all but reinforced the segregation by school borders. And so um, I think that there is a lot in terms of what we could do systemically to help the education system be more equal and more equitable. Something that is unique to Pittsburgh, something that is part of the way our schools are funded or the catchment areas across the country, how big of a problem? Well, I, I believe it was the Department of Education a couple of years ago released, released a report that um, Pennsylvania has one of the most um, inequitable school systems because we have so many school districts. Um, you know, I think Pennsylvania has something like 500 school districts and some of those school districts have 700 kids. Some of them have, like Pittsburgh Public has 22,000. And so what that ends up doing, particularly when you're relying on um, a tax system based on housing property values, is it creates an equity in funding, it creates an equity in opportunities. Um, the type of work that is even put in front of students is different. And so I think just being more critical about that system we could change some things for children and ultimately our country. Yeah, so the education system, which we've just talked about, the criminal mm -hmm. justice system that the documentary talks about, mm -hmm. both two very clear cut cases of institutional racism. Mm -hmm. The numbers from this film were absolutely astounding and we, you, you just can't deny them, but we're mm -hmm. doing a pretty darn good job of ignoring <laughs> them. We are. What's going on? Why, why, when you talk to people, why aren't people more plugged into either criminal justice reform to education reform? Why aren't people engaging with this issue, which is really in many, the civil rights issue of our day? Absolutely. So I think, um, I think there's a couple, there's a couple of things, you know, I think for a lot of people, they are not aware um, that there is this much of a disparity, that there are um, problems in even the way that laws are written so that certain types of crimes committed by certain types of people are um, charged more heavily, have longer sentencing times. You know, a lot of people are not aware of those types of racist practices and policies and laws. And so they don't know what to even be outraged about or what to be angry about. And so it's really easy to, um, you know, get stuck in our little bubble in the day-to-day -day hustle of, of life and just focus on the things that you can control without 
actually diving deep into why things are the way that they are. And I think, to be honest, a lot of that does start with schools, right? Like if we do not have diverse perspectives honored in our curricula, if we're not studying, you know, what's happening and what has happened in our past, honestly, um, then it makes it really difficult as an adult to face those truths, you know? Um, part of my work at Pittsburgh Public is I'm an equity affiliate. And so we do a training called Beyond Diversity through Courageous Conversations about around race. And um, part of that training is to talk about redlining. And a lot of folks don't understand what redlining is. They had no idea that redlining existed. And so what happens is they have this false sense of who they are and these ideas challenge that. And so it becomes very difficult to understand um, and to even know how to, to grapple with, with the ideas themselves. And this film highlighted the way in which the war on drugs was absolutely political rather than mm -hmm. in the interest it purported to be of public health. Now, the way our schools are funded right now seems to be super political rather than in students' best interest. What changes, what, if you had a magic wand that you got to wave and redo the system of education we have in this country, what would it look like? How would you, how would you begin to address some of these structural and systemic inequities? I think that is a wonderful question. Um, and, you know, my magic wand would have a, a couple of different parts to it. I believe it's San Antonio um, School District in Texas is actually working on a model where they are, um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's essentially, they are looking not only at race, they're looking at socioeconomic status, they're looking at whether or not the families are homeowners, and they've created this new model of, um, open schools. And so you can apply to the schools of choice within the district and everyone has to apply. And then they wait the, um, with those five categories to see which school you'll get in. And there's only so many people of each type of thing that you can get into the school. And so it creates more of an equitable environment. So I think the first thing that I would do um, would be something like that. Uh, the second thing that I would want to do is to really take a look at school policies um, and think very critically about who we punish and why we punish and how that school to prison pipeline gets started very early for children, sometimes even in preschool. And um, I would wanna do a lot of work with that. And then I would also want to look at our curricular resources and make sure that they're not only representative of diverse perspectives, that people of color are represented fairly, um, that you know, touchy situations that have happened in history where people might have feelings about them are represented um, as impartially as possible, but that teachers are also prepared to have that conversation with children. Because, you know, as teachers, we're all human and we, you know, have our biases and it's really important for us to do that work as the adults in the room to help children um, better be able to comprehend what has happened in our past so that they can work to prevent it in the future. Excuse me. Let's talk a little bit more, if you would, about that school to prison pipeline, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a direct tie between the video we watched and what you are working on professionally and academically. It's in many ways the double whammy, uh, particularly mm -hmm. pertaining to people of color, because the, the numbers of inequitable punishment, justice within the school system are mind blowing. What, what's happening? Say a little bit more about it and just what the problem is. Yeah, so um, from what I've seen, you know, just I can speak of one of the principles of courageous conversations around race is to keep it personal, local and immediate. So I'm gonna do that. Um, and, and what I've seen is it, is it is a difference of what we are willing to accept and from whom. And so there are expectations, you know, typically in school buildings, especially in urban areas, we do a really great job of outlining what our expectations are. 
Um, and we do a really great job of outlining what happens if you do not meet those expectations. But what I have seen happen is that some children are punished more harshly um, time and time again, and they, they almost get a rap where, oh, this, this child in second grade does not care about education, his family doesn't value education. And so what happens is that child learns early on that school is not for him or it's not for her, um, and they're pushed out. You know, they've been suspended multiple times. They miss that learning. School goes on. Um, and as a school administrator, that was something that I had to ta tackle myself when I was a principal. Um, I looked at our numbers and we at my school had a disparity of Black children were suspended more than white children for the same exact uh, punishments. And so, you know, racist thinking and racist ideas are not um, you know, central to white people. We all live in a society where we grew up with these ideas. And so again, it's up to us to really be thinking critically and how can we do the work so that we are better um, and create a better place for our children. I listened to a lecture from Jonathan Haidt, who is a, an NYU professor. And one of the things he was saying is that often either diversity or tolerance or anti-racist education it seems ineffective because it works while you're thinking about it. And then the moment you stop thinking about it, you've switched back to your previously held bias. Mm -hmm. And so in his mind, that meant we need to be coming up with a better system. In my mind, it meant we just needed to be doing, having those conversations all the time so that it right. doesn't get to slip off of people's minds. You know, you, you mentioned that so much of this should be local and so much should be about being able to speak to lived experience. Would you share a little of your lived experience? Um, I am somewhat new to Mount Lebanon and the South Hills. Um, there, there is a bit of diversity here and we look a little bit different than the city of Pittsburgh. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious your experience working in Pittsburgh public, having a foot in the South Hills school districts. What, what have been some of your experiences? Yeah. so. I'm also kind of new to the South Hills. We moved here in June of last year. Um, and we moved here particularly for the school district. Uh, so my husband and I, my husband's white, so we are a multiracial family. And um, we did a lot of research and what areas and neighborhoods were gonna work for us, particularly we wanted um, a suburban school that had an award-winning school district, um, but that was also something that went a place that went blue in the 2016 and 2018 elections um, so that we knew that there would be some like-minded folks around us. And I'll be honest with you, um, when speaking to my family members, because um, I grew up in Coriopolis, they were very hesitant um, to have me move to the South Hills. And um, even in like my own personal experiences growing up in Pittsburgh, I had never come to um, the South Hills that often um, with the exception of going to Pottery Barn Kids at the Galleria. Um, and so coming here, you know, we were looking at the numbers and, you know, I think the school district is something like 90% white. Um, and it seemed 90% that I was thinking, oh, there's that means there's 10% of other people. Um, so that's great. We can, I can work with that. And then I got here and it was just like, oh my gosh, no, I don't see that 10%. You know, we're we're all over the place. And so um that it was really hard. It was an adjustment for me. It was an adjustment for my children. You know, my five-year-old had actually talked about wanting to blend in. So he didn't want to put lotion in, on his skin because it would make him look whiter and um, so we had some some tough times, but I will also say that we have created some really great friendships and, and a sense of community here that I'm really, really proud of and really, really thankful for. Um, because, you know, when I have had tough times, whether it be with something that was happening at school or something that was just happening in the community, it has been really great to have people to turn to. And to be honest with you, um, Temple Emanuel was one of those places for us. You know, I think that you guys do an amazing job of creating community and creating a sense of family. And so I felt like before school even started, we knew people because there were so many events that we could go to and connect with. Um, and so it just felt really great. So um, we're liking it so far. Uh, we like living here and, and uh, we plan on staying. 
I'm so glad to hear that. I'm glad that Temple Emmanuel is able to be helpful in mm -hmm. in that sense of community. You know, one of the one of the things my family loves about the school is that it is diverse, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't wasn't sure that was going to be the case, and it it would be wrong for me to not look at a Jewish option for my kid, and mm -hmm. yet to have to have a school with a Jewish flavor, with an amazing staff, and with with the diversity that exists in the classroom is, is really, really important to help kids grow up and better understand this multicultural world in which they live. I agree. So we have an interesting question coming in. and I'm not sure I completely understand it. That is, I've been wrapped up in my own bubble, um, but a question about the City of Pittsburgh Equity Commission report and whether that, what impact that has on the work that you are doing, or if you have any thoughts related to it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, is, I don't know if that is the report that showed, um, you know, if black people lived anywhere else in America, they would be better off. Um, is that the report that they're referring is, to? Right. And so okay. I've got another note that says that this report examined data related to health, education, poverty, mm -hmm. employment. Um, they, they tried to create an index of ranked livability to assess how race and gender groups compare to each other and then in other cities. So yeah, you're right on. Yep, okay. Um, you know, so I haven't read the report in its totality. I have seen excerpts from it. Um, and it's crushing. I mean, it really is. And, and so my work doesn't really have a lot to do with that report and it has everything to do with the report at the same time, right? Like, so my, the Office of School Transformation was established before that report came out. Um, but the work that we are doing is all about erasing racial inequities within our school district um, and within the schools that we serve. And so, um, you know, personally, I can speak to, you know, some of the health um, issues that they've had. I have had a lot of racially driven um, excusing of my concerns and things like that, you know, having gone to hospitals when I was having our children. And, um, and I have seen firsthand a lot of the, the racial issues that happen within the school districts that then facilitate these racial disparities because children that are graduating are not um, you know, as competitive as some of the other students coming from the suburban schools. And, um, you know, I, ha I have seen that firsthand. And so I think that there is a lot of work to do. And I think that the schools are um, one part of that, one part of that work. So part of the genesis for this conversation, you, Michelle Markowitz, who is the incoming Temple Emanuel president, and I were going to get together with a group of folks. Um, Josh Sales from Federation is forming this 412 Black Jewish Collaborative, just recognizing that any attempt to get something done is an important attempt Absolutely. right now. Um, unfortunately, along with so many things in life right now that got put on hold. But this is a really unique opportunity for all of us to be to be doing some of the reading, to be doing some of the watching. And again, if you haven't watched this documentary, I would urge you to do so as soon as we're done this evening. What else should we be looking at? What else should we be reading to better prepare to re-enter the world when we get to leave our homes? Because yeah. these issues aren't stopping while we press pause on other facets of life. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, I would argue they're probably getting worse. You know, if I thought a lot about these last couple of weeks and having my children at home um, and, and all of the things that I poured into them, you know, with reading, with math and just thinking about my parents who are considered essential workers. And so they're at the gas stations and they're at the grocery stores and, and their children are at home and they're not able to do what we do. So, you know, I'm feeling I was, I've been feeling a lot of like guilt and, and being torn about feeling blessed to have this situation where I'm allowed to be at home working with my children um, and, and feeling like we are just exasperating the inequities and that this, the coronavirus, um, you know, stay at home orders are just, just making the fault lines that we have seen further exposed. Um, but some of the things that I would recommend, because it's interesting, my pastor actually said on, on Sunday, 
Um, you know, are you going to be better after all of this is over? Are you going to be broken? And I think it's really important that we are better um, after it. And so some of the things that I would recommend, um, especially for white folks who are wanting to figure out, like, how do I start? What do I do? Um, Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, is a great place to start um, because you really can't help anyone else move forward in their journey if you don't understand where you are on yours and how you move forward. And so um, I would think that that is a great book uh, to start with. Tim Wise has a really good YouTube clip. It's called Train Yourself to See It. So if you just search Tim Wise and Train Yourself to See It, um, he talks about how it's really easy for white people because you don't recognize what um, you know, people of color are going through because it's not happening to you um, in real time. And so you have to train yourself to see what's happening in those moments and then also have a response for how you're going to handle it when you do eventually see it. No, there's one resource that I would add to the list. This takes a conversation in a different direction that we're going to have to go down as we as we develop trust within the congregation, as we do a better job interfacing with our partners throughout the city, as, as we get to explore some of these ourselves. Uh, Karen Brodkin wrote a book called How the Jews Became White. And it really examines how it's possible for a Jewish community to at one hand have this very internally felt minority status while participating in and benefiting from those very systems of racism that put down other minorities. Mm -hmm. um, how the Jews became white is essential reading as we dive further and further, further into, into the conversations that we need to be having. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn, what haven't I asked you? Anything that you would want to add for the good of the order as you think on this conversation or on the documentary? Um, you know, so, I am part of a, a parent group um, that is really looking for ways to make our schools more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive. Um, so I'd welcome anybody to come and join us. Um, we, we have only had one large group meeting, um, but we're really thinking about ways that we can all um, support a lot of the things that I've been talking about within the Mount Lebanon School District. So. I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. Um, it's called the Citizens Alliance for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, so I would suggest anyone to reach out if you would like to have more information. Um, you can shoot me an email, jvardinger at gmail.com, um, and, and we can get you set up for our next meeting. And another great book I was just thinking about um, is Ibram Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist because um, that was one that really like just hit me in my tracks. If you're not being actively anti-racist, then you are being racist. You're participating in a racist society and it really is um, that simple and that difficult at the same time. That's right. Thank you so much for your time. I very much look forward to this being the start of a conversation. Yeah, me too. We need to do rather than a one-off while we're all stuck at home. Thank you. Give Izzy Thank a hug you. for me. Be safe. And I look forward to talking to you. Me too. Yes. Thank you. Have a good night.